Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Mind Split Cafe. My man, Matt, how's it going? Hey, what's going on, good people? And we got Kristen from Peak, out coming from New Mexico, and we are so excited. We've been trying to get you on forever, so welcome to the show, Kristen. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought we were going to have to pay you or something to come yeah, on. Yeah, like, I mean, it's not too late. Just it's saying. not too late. Oh, no, it's it's going to send us a Venmo it's request. Late. I'll send you an invoice. Don't worry. It's fine. <laughs> No, well, I'm very like happy to five be here. Cents, so that's it. So what? that's all you get. Five cents. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So welcome like back to the in show. 1875. Yeah. That, that would have been a lot. That would have been a it lot. It would have been. I would have been happy with that then. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Kristen, there is something that you wanted to say before we got started, right? And then, uh, so if you want to take the time to say it now, then please go ahead, and then we'll we'll jump into the topics and. We're excited about this next 30 minutes just chatting with you. Sure. Well, I definitely hope not to let you guys down, um, especially after hearing who you guys have coming up soon. And I'm not going to give it away, yeah. but I'm just going to create a little bit of interest, right? And intrigue in yeah. your audience yeah. to see who's coming on next. So no pressure for me. Um, but, you know, I, I am with Peak Behavioral Health and we are located in Santa Teresa, New Mexico. If you've never heard of Santa Teresa, New Mexico, it's about a mile away from El Paso, Texas, depending on which way you're coming from, right? So, um, you know, it is it is a little rural area, um, but that is where our acute hospital is located in Santa Teresa, New Mexico. But Peak Behavioral um, is very forward thinking, and we really look at our community being the majority of the state of, of New Mexico, but El Paso County as well, and really trying to figure out where there are gaps in treatment and service as it relates to mental health and substance use treatment. And so we've been expanding throughout the state of New Mexico, which is very exciting. So we have an outpatient clinic in Las Cruces and an outpatient clinic now in Española, um, New wow. Mexico, which if you've never heard of Española, New Mexico, Google it, but don't believe everything you read because it is a beautiful, beautiful community with beautiful people. And these kiddos are just incredible. So we are very happy to be in Española, New Mexico, and then goodness knows where else after that, right? So we're, we're always looking to see where we can be of assistance where the need is. Um, but what I wanted to say, uh, in addition to that, is I am not a clinician um, by any means. I'm currently working on my master's of healthcare administration, but I am not a clinician. I have, however, worked in the mental health field for 20 years, um, so yes, I started when I was 10, just in case you were wondering, right? <laughs> Botox is fabulous. <laughs> um, that, was, that was smooth. That was good. I like that. Smooth, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've worked, I've worked in and around the mental health field now for 20 years. And also my uh, my father was uh, diagnosed with a serious mental illness. And so, you know, my parents, bless my mom's heart, stayed, they stayed married the whole 37 years. Um, until his passing in 2017. And so I always tell people this is the world in which I was born, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mental health is is supposed to be where where I am and where I spend most of my life. And I absolutely love, you live it. Lo I it. love it. You I live, live it. it. I've lived yeah. it. Um, absolutely. And we were actually talking, you know, before this that, you know, public speaking is one of people in the United States top three fears, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not for me. Like I, I love public speaking. I love presenting. I love teaching. I love talking about mental health, but for you guys, I don't know why you just, I'm, I'm so nervous. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's important to talk about that because, um, it's anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I've got the heart palpitations and my fingers are going numb and I'm getting all sweaty and I feel like I want to go vomit. Um, and I'm not going to. And why is that? Why? Is I know. That? Why, why do I feel like, Oh, uh, you mentioned off camera, the, the kind of like the techniques that you can use to try and kind of alleviate those. I mean, everybody has anxiety. Everybody has fears. Don't get me wrong. Right. Yeah. And, but Kind of talk to the, the audience about what you were telling us off camera about what you the techniques you use to kind of alle alleviate, you know, you yeah. blowing chunks on the air. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and if you don't mind, can you kind of discuss why anxiety happens in yeah. certain situations? I think that would be a cool one to for the listeners. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think the reason why I was embarrassed that I'm having this like little um, episode of of anxiety is because I teach this this process to people, right? I've done a lot of research on the the limbic system and um, you know how the amygdala acting as our brain and body's kind of guard dog, right? And being able to perceive whether something is um, a danger to us. And that's that's why our, our limbic system gets fired up is because of a, a perceived threat or danger or whatever. And in this situation, if you think about it, I'm having a, an, an episode of anxiety because my, my fear is letting you guys down. And oh, so my, no. well, by, by, but the fear is, <laughs> The, yes, you have a, a genuine yeah. fear. I'm telling you that you're not going to let us down, but yeah. you, there is a genuine fear, and that's why everything is going on. Right. Yeah. Inside. Your amygdala is like, hey, wait, this is a possible danger. Let me go ahead and tap into my hippocampus and go through my little files of what's considered what is actually dangerous. And then, you know, your hippocampus goes into your hypothalamus and then all sorts of weird things start to happen with your body and you release all of these, um, you know, uh, hormones and, and chemicals into your body. And what I always find really funny is that this is your your brain's way of getting your body ready for fight, flight or freeze. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it, I would love to talk more about it, but that that's not really what I wanted to focus on. But it's interesting what happens from a physiological perspective when your limbic system gets fired up, because while your brain is supposed to be setting you up for survival, everything that happens to your body sets you up basically to die. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, your heart rate is going so fast, but then your blood pressure drops. And so because your heart rate is so fast, but your blood pressure drops, you can't pass out, but you feel like you're going to pass out. You know, your blood gets diverted into your, your innards, right? These are your extremities. I guess these are your intremities. I just like to yeah. make up words. No, uh, that, that works. I like that. We'll put a dictionary <laughs> definition on the screen for it too. There you go. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you start to get muscle weakness and you start to shake and then your, your bladder wants to empty, your bowels want to empty. You want to get rid of all of this stuff that's in your belly, right? That's the throwing up. But because your heart rate is so high and your blood pressure is so low, you cannot pass out, even though you feel like you're going to. So, you know, eventually you have to work through that process of feeling like, you know, I'm going to pee in my pants. I'm going to mess myself. I'm going to throw up. I'm going to pass out. I feel like I'm going to fall to the ground because my muscles are so weak. And you push through that, push through that, push through that. And then you'll, your prefrontal cortex shuts down. And so then you start to like lose your rational thought process. Yeah. So that's when your body's like, it's go time, right? Yeah. And so I mean, if you think about it, it worked for Eminem in Eight Mile. You know, he was in the bathroom, vomited on his sweater already, mom's <laughs> spaghetti, right? And then he walks out, he walks through the crowd, goes to the stage, crushes and, it, you know, and he crushes it. So, crushes it. You know, there you go. And that is the same thing what's going to happen with you crushing. You don't it. have any vomit on your sweater already, but. Um, <laughs> But you are going to crush this episode. So ah. I am so happy that you're here. Well, thank you. No, it's such a pleasure. And, you know, I think people, um, you know, talking about experiencing anxiety, right? Anxiety and depression is those are the two most common um, diagnosis diagnoses in mental health. But it's it's bizarre to me how people want to. Um, try to dismiss it or, you know, think that it's not happening. I'm not talking about coping skills, right, or coping mechanisms. I'm just trying to to say how, you know, people try to pretend that that doesn't happen to them. I once asked a girlfriend who, you know, is a, a very, very um, highly sought out therapist, mental health professional. I said, do you, do you ever experience anxiety, like these panic attacks or panic mm -hmm. moments? And she said, no, <laughs> no, no. Wow. Like, That's a lie. <laughs> how is that possible? I think everybody has to. I'm yeah, it's sorry, human nature. Every, you can't, yeah, you can't go through life to. without experiencing it. At Palms Behavioral Health, we understand the journey to mental wellness. Our dedicated team offers personalized care for adolescents, adults, and seniors. We focus on individualized treatment plans, addressing a wide range of mental health needs. Our evidence-based practices 
and trauma-informed care ensure sensitive and effective treatment. Palms Behavioral Health, Healing Minds, Empowering Lives. Contact us today. You know, I had this conversation with my son um, last year. You know, I played college ball and now my son does too. And um, show off. He, it, well, I, I'm just, <laughs> let me, let me kind of get to, Love it. you know, but I played in the late nineties, like, you know, 96 to 2000. When we were going through it, we, th there weren't key words or hot topics like mental health, mental wellness, you know, it was just like, okay, Walk you're going off. through something. Your teammates are probably going through it. Everybody's going through it as an athlete. You just kind of push through it, right? Now, fast forward to, you know, last year when my son's going through it and he's having panic attacks, anxiety attacks, you know, that are debilitating to, he just like curls up and just, you know, crouches yeah. over. And he asked me, dad, when you were playing, did you ever experience this? And you know what? I said, Evan, I probably did, but I didn't know what it was. Right. You know? We didn't have the help and the knowledge that you guys have today, you know? Right. And so. Or it wasn't okay to have those feelings, right? Like exactly. pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It was kind of taboo, right? Right. And, and push so, on. Yeah. I, I just said, as long as you feel that you, you want to carry on, because that was the first question I asked is, do you want to end everything? And he was like, no. I was like, okay, then we can find you help and we can find you tools to get you through you know, these attacks and, and, you know, things to, to cope. And, and we did, and he, yeah. you know, he went and saw a therapist and he, it's, his, you know, he's still going and he's great now, you know, or he's, he's on the road, he's on that track to, to, yes. you know, so I, I just think that, uh, I think people like you that have been 20, 20 years into the game and have lived it even before you were a therapist at the age of five, like, not you a know. therapist remember oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> you're right you you know you've been in the game since you, the age of five right because you're like 22 now right so absolutely 100 you know um but uh i think having having the the structure and the 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 knowledge that you guys can share i think it's it's amazing well and i'm glad that you mentioned that because I'm not going to pretend to know y'all's ages, but I'm I'm guessing we're around the same age. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher, you look like a baby, so I I don't know how old you are, but Matt, I'm I feel 36. like we're like I'll right there. I'll throw it out. I'm 36. <laughs> oh, just a wee babe, but we're still in the same generation. Yeah, so same generation. you know exactly, we are millennials. Uh, Matt, you and I are elder millennials, right? Yeah. Um, or are you Gen X? I believe I'm on the cusp. I think how old are you? I'm I think um I was born seventy eight, so I'm forty five, oh, yeah. almost forty six. He's still millennial. He's um, no, he's young no, Gen X I'm friend. On the cusp, yeah. yeah. I lived I'm... in an era with no where you had to memorize the the friends' home phone phone number. numbers. Yeah. Hey, I'm from that. I'm from that area too. Yeah. yeah, I had to memorize phone numbers, the dial tone of when yeah. you try to sign on to AOL. I oh, being yeah. in college without internet. You know, going to yeah, high school, the library. Yeah, going to the library and uh, having your to micro do research, like, or you whatever were it do was. a research paper. You had to go through the encyclopedias and Nightmare. write the sources. And oh yeah, yeah. Well, it was, I think we're better for it though, sir. Oh yeah, um, I remember having to find directions without mm -hmm. Google Maps or ways. You know. Oh yeah, I was lost constantly. That. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. No, I, I can't live without my without my GPS. But you know, I'm glad you mentioned that about your son. So, you know, I think um Gen X, millennials, I think we we are getting to the point where we have a better understanding of mental health, mental health disorders and and kind of what that looks like behaviorally, right? And so we're teaching our kids. I have a 24 year old um daughter who is just beautiful inside and out. And I've never met somebody in my life um, that has a better understanding of mental health and, and right. And not being judgmental because she can put herself in other people's shoes mm -hmm. and she has that empathy and that understanding. Yep. And I want to think that that has a little bit to do with, with me and my, my husband's upbringing of her. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so what, what I'm seeing, and again, these are personal observations, right? Um, I haven't done research into it. And, and again, I'm not a clinician, but I'm starting to see that our younger generations um, are, you know, to use the, the, the vernacular of the children, uh, they're woke, right? So <laughs> they're, they're woke. I don't know. No I have a question. So I have a question. So your, your daughter is around the same age as Evan. Evan just turned 23. So they're right around the same age, but you, you said, obviously your background, you, you lived it right mm -hmm. with your dad. And then being who you are as a professional, your daughter has a better understanding than maybe, you know, most teenagers or young adults, right? Mm -hmm. The question I have is, did your husband, his background, did he grow up in that kind of environment too? Or did he learn everything that your daughter has gained? Is it all because of you and your profession? Or was it like a combined your daughter's knowledge was combined from you and your husband. Not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, my husband is very much Gen X um, and I love him to death. We've been married for, for 24 years. Right. And still going strong. We're going to get old together and throw bedpans at each other. I love it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he, his upbringing was very different because his parents were older. Uh -huh. when they had him so these are like older boomers right they're yeah. in their late 70s right now um and they like close to hitting their 80s and so they were very very much of the the like tough hard it out mentality. Like, right yeah. yeah just you just yeah. push through it and you know you're fine and you're just blah, like grit and and all that yeah. and so you know he had had zero understanding of mental health and and actually today, even, um, anytime we have an argument, many times it's surrounding mental health and suicidality and, um, addiction and serious mental illness. And, and we just fight relentlessly over that. So, um, I guess I will take that credit. I do think that, yeah, yeah. yeah because, but, but also I, I want to give credit to us as a society, as well yeah. to the younger Absolutely. generations being more woke because because of social media right and we can say all the things we want to say about social media the good the bad the ugly um but you know if we were also talking about ADHD before we started and you know you have all of these uh these influencers whose posts mm -hmm. are surrounding mental health and ADHD and um autism spectrum and um you know all other types of mental health disorders and and so these kids are scrolling through that right and so they're they're learning more and and a lot of these posts are are very educational you know yeah, some of are. them you're like ah oh they probably you know uh, don't, don't do <laughs> you're gonna yeah. yeah confuse people um so i think the younger generations are um the stigma is starting to again personal observation decrease i i younger. a thousand percent Absolutely agree. It has. i people so, don't look at people that need ment like help they don't look at it as a like leprosy you know you look at oh you right. know like you, they don't look at it like that anymore like oh you know it's more like the empathy side oh i can i can kind of relate to what they're going through i'm really right. happy that they're probably seeking out treatment or help you know so yeah. it is wearing it is that that stigma is wearing away you know so and people feel more comfortable talking about it i yeah. um i flew we just had a corporate conference in um franklin tennessee with summit behavioral health corp and i you just struck up a conversation the only conversation that you're ever going to regret having is the conversation you don't have <laughs> yeah. right um, and so I just struck up a conversation with this old uh, veteran and um, we started talking and I left to, of course, use the ladies before hopping on the plane. So that wasn't the first thing I had to do when I got on the plane. And mm -hmm. when I came back, he said, um, have you ever flown, you know, uh, pre-boarding, -pre I guess? And I said, nope, don't even know what that is. He said, well, you're going to be my my partner. And I said, okay. And, and, you know, I found out that the reason he was pre-boarding is because he was a, a, is a hundred percent disabled veteran. Um, he was in desert storm. He was, you know, it, over there several times. And then finally retired after 21 years when they wanted to send him to Afghanistan. And he said, Nope, I'm done. I'm done. 
And, you know, he has some traumatic brain injuries, TBIs, um, mm. a lot of PTSD and, and anxiety and bless his heart when, you know, we got to sit at the front of the plane. Um, cause I know you can't tell on video, but I am giganticus. I'm a big girl and I need my leg space. And so I'm um, glad to have gotten to pre-board with him, but you could tell through the whole flight that he was really, really struggling with his anxiety. And so I was trying to, you know, kind of help him out and console him. Not that it was any of my business to do so, but I felt compelled to, or, or just, uh, pushed to, I suppose, yeah. and gave him some like tapping techniques, right. And, and just some breathing techniques. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of seeing a, a shift, I think in the stigma. Um, but it's like people, our age and older generations, while we're, we're still, we're starting to feel more comfortable having these conversations. Cause I, I talked to him about his anxiety. I talked to him about yeah. my own personal anxiety right. and issues and, you know, whatever. And so we had that great conversation and this guy was probably in his sixties, you know, um, but where I'm seeing the shift in stigma, um, is, and I hope you guys don't get a lot of comments on this, but it's professional to professional. And, and I think that we as professionals are very unforgiving, um, when, when on the, on outward appearance, successful people, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and life that are, that are adults, um, it's, it's almost as if they're not allowed still <laughs> to have an yeah. actual diagnosis. You know what I mean? Like you find out um, that let's say, you know, a clinical director at a med surge hospital or clinical director over the ER, whatever, of a med surge hospital has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. What is your first thought or perception? Many yeah. people and having conversations with people and I'm constantly in the community, right? So I'm always talking to people, having these conversations. The first thought in a lot of people's minds is, oh, wow, how, how, how do you manage to do your job and how are you functioning? Yeah. How, are you, how are you a you, surgeon and you're bipolar? Like, it's, you know, it's, yeah. We're so unforgiving. It's as if we're, we're not allowed to, to lose our marbles. But I'm here to tell you, you know what? It's, as an adult, I don't care how successful or unsuccessful you are. If you lose your marbles, that is okay. If you need a friend or a therapist to help you find all those marbles, put those marbles back in that yeah. bag put that bag back in your brain you know what i mean that's okay yeah. and we shouldn't think any differently you when know, something we're happened all, we're all old enough to remember there was that stigma um they used to say it it was like the late 90s um where it's like oh you're going postal yeah yeah oh yeah there, there was that series it was just one or two isolated incidences where unfortunately these postal workers random isolated right but they just got fed up and they just went you know they uh, went postal. yeah they went they postal, went <laughs> you know and so there was that negative connotation and that stigma attached to if you lose your marbles or you have a blow up or you just can't take it anymore you're gonna go postal you right. know and right. so it's unfortunate for the u.s postal department for having that you know but I love my postal worker. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> Shout out to all the postal workers out there, right? But <laughs> hashtag what, love postal workers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's unfortunate that you know there's a negative connotation yeah. that that there's that stigma to it, and, it, and I, I want to I want to jump ahead, in Chris. and ask why do you think there's a negative connotation with mental health? And I know we we discussed it, you know dissipating and, and no longer being there uh, but why do you think just personal opinion why do you think the society has placed a stigma on mental health issues to begin with so and again i i'm just i'm just guessing here and this is these are just my own personal um thoughts i think that because we growing up did have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Yep. You think about millennials and the younger Gen Xs. We are now the leaders of organizations, right? We're the leaders. Mm -hmm. And we still grew up with that mentality. Pull yourself up, up by your bootstraps. But 
we were the ones that are teaching the younger generations that it's okay to not be okay, that it's, you know, okay to go to a therapist. It's okay to lose your marbles. Let me help you find them. Um, but we're still, it's still stuck, whether we want to think so or not, that, you know what, I had to push through it and I had to struggle and I had to endure. You should too. Shame yeah. on you. And we see it as a weakness, which is so unfortunate and so, so sad. And I don't know, I don't know how to fix that. You know, I don't, I don't know how to get our aged folks to, to also know that it's okay to not be okay. And we, we talk the talk, right? Yeah. We talk the talk. It's our talk that now these younger generations are talking. That's what we taught them. Um, but we still, I don't think feel it in our bones that it's mm -hmm. okay to not be okay. Yeah. You know, and, and think about this guys, how hard is life? Just, Stopping question there. How hard is life? Life is hard. It's life hard. is so not hard easy. right now. It is not a Disney movie. It's like, not a Disney movie. It's yeah. Not a Disney movie. Never I have be. my problems with Disney movies. Like what happens after Cinderella gets the prince? Cinderella doesn't get the prince. They movie. don't live happily ever after. They are. Yeah. Like, like you know, somebody's got to do the dishes and the prince probably didn't take out the trash. So then that's a fight. Like, you know, well, and the person that has to do the dishes is working until 8 p.m. And they get home and they're like, I don't want to do the dishes. I what is this happily ever after stuff? Right? It's such I'm a farce. Here. Like it is yeah. so. Yes. You know, it is. Everything's expensive. Right. Um, you know, shame on you for wanting that new vehicle because now you have a $500 a month payment and, you know, you're struggling for, for food and you're living paycheck to paycheck and then everything that's going on nationwide and worldwide and, you know, all of these stressors and, you know, think about where, where I'm at, right. I'm very close yeah. to El Paso. Think about everything that's going on in the border and that yeah. that's my backyard. Yeah. Um, and so these are all out like outside of work and professional life and family life yeah. that are things that are, that are struggles and, and just to, to push through. Um, and then you tack on, you know, stresses at work because I love my job and I love peak, um, you know, but sometimes we get tired, um, yeah. you know, and then get tired and frustrated and <clears throat> you can't, you can't go through life without experiencing it. Right. I'm sure and there's times child. Like, I'm sure there's times where Chris gets tired of his co-host, you know? <laughs> nah, no. Nah, not at all. <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> well, damn. I'm kidding. I'm well, kidding. Damn. Okay. This will um, be my last episode, guys. Signing off. Might have a new co-host come next week. You know. So. But so I, what are you doing uh, every day, every Wednesday on, at this time? You want to be my new co-host? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, then you just, yes. Kristen, you just became the new co-host. So there you I go. Understood. There's my signature. Oh, actually, not, but well, that's you it. know what? <laughs> this this time has actually flown by. Like yeah. it is, it has flown by, and I told you that you were going to be amazed on how fast it goes. Yeah, and I can't, I can't thank you enough for you lending, you know, thirty minutes of your day, and to join our show because the wealth of knowledge you just given us is. I hope we, somebody in the audience can take it with them, but you're more than welcome to come back anytime you want to come back. Oh, I appreciate you. that, guys. And, you know, I think something that I just like a message, I think that I want to to leave to everybody. And I'm going to cry on the inside like a winner when I say this, because I just I love people so much. And and I'm probably one of the least judgmental people that you will ever meet. You know, if my best friend came to me and said, you know, hey, Kristen, I'm pregnant and the father is my pimp. And, you know, I just snorted 30 lines of of Coke last night. I'd be like, oh. Okay. Oh, wild in New Mexico. Come on, you're moving. On. No, I'm just saying, like extreme situations, right? I wouldn't judge. I'd, I'd be like, honey, come on, I will How take you through it. it. Right, yeah. right, right. Let's let's do this. Um, and so what I want people to to understand, and it is easier said than done, but I think we owe each other a little bit of grace. Just yeah, great. Yeah. And That's very true understanding and if mm -hmm. you know someone that loses their marble marbles don't judge them for losing yeah. their marbles you know what i mean help them pick them up help them find them um yeah. or send them to someone who can and we need to we need to understand that that that's 
okay. You know, yeah. it's, it's interesting because you can see somebody and by all outward appearances, you think, wow, you know, this person really has it together. And, you know, but that's just the dollhouse on the outside, right? Nobody knows what's going on behind these curtains. Nobody wants nope. to know what's going on behind my curtains up here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe you do. It gets a little, uh, it gets a little wild in there, <laughs> but just, just to have some grace and, and understanding and that. understand that. that we don't know what's going on in other people's dollhouses and we just need to be gentle. I, I think you I you are a fabulous guest. I think that you should get your own show. You should definitely get your own podcast. So I think so too. Funny you say. So. <laughs> Currently I think working. You're definitely on that. deserving of your own show. You know, Aww. so just well, a perk. Just a perk. Just so. just a perk. Mm -hmm. Just a perk. Yeah. I like that. that. That's a great idea. Yeah, it, yeah, that's yeah, a great yeah. Idea. I, I do too. Well, well, we'll Kristen, thank you so course. much for joining the show. We really, really enjoy you, and you're welcome back anytime you want to come back and just chat and hang out and talk, whatever you want to do. Like, you're always mm -hmm. welcome. I love it. I love mental Kristen, health. For, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but for the <laughs> viewers, do you want to go ahead and let them know um, how they can get in touch with you with exactly. you and your facility if they're in the area of your facilities? Oh my goodness. Yes. Thank you. Um, so with peak behavioral, we are, uh, again, we're a hospital. We're open 24, seven, 366. Cause I think it's a leap year this year. Um, right. It is. There it is you a go. Leap year. Um, yep. and, and so of course, walk-ins are always welcome at 5056 McNutt road, Santa Teresa, 88008. Um, anybody can call us for more information at 575-589-3000. You could check out our website at peakbehavioral.com. Follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, and, you know, just give us a call. Give us a call um, anytime. Love that. If you just need Perfect. to chat and figure out what the best direction is for, for you in getting help, we're here. Well, you're an amazing That's person, great. and we we thank you so much. No, I thank you guys both. It's been a pleasure. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in, and we will see you next week. Like, we weren't supposed to come up with something this clean. <laughs> like, something happened.